All right, we'll get started uh, for another exciting uh, event. That is the August-September combined event uh, for the Brain Expert Community Session. Uh, we have a lot of exciting stuff to get you started on your journey for advanced data analytics or AI in healthcare. Uh, so let's kick this off. So a few of you might be joining us for the first time, but Brinex community was formed uh, four years ago uh, with the idea of having a platform for machine learning in healthcare for good. And that picture represents our first meeting. That time we used to have physical meetings uh, at our location, but now we have gone virtual. Uh, we have a community that is 4,000 plus members strong and a very diverse community for with people from all different backgrounds. And there are 2,000 uh, active members on our LinkedIn group. So uh, the, a lot of information sharing that occurs through that LinkedIn group. And of course, we have our web page. I'll go over some of the features of the web page. Uh, and then we do these monthly live sessions uh, over here uh, so that we help everybody with, pro provide everybody with educational material, but also an opportunity to collaborate together. So this is uh, our website. Uh, it has few key sections. Uh, the home page, which has all the updates, you might have seen that. That's where we uh, put in all the information for our upcoming events uh, or interesting publications or maybe a podcast. We have our connect section where we house the information uh, for our events. And that also takes you to the recordings of these, uh, these sessions, which are housed on our own YouTube channel, the BrainX Community YouTube channel. So please subscribe that so that uh, if you miss any event, you can get that event information and uh, access to that right away. So please subscribe us uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, as I mentioned, a very active LinkedIn group. We share a lot of uh, educational material, uh, scholarly work over there, but also interesting upcoming meetings and opportunities to meet each other now finally that COVID has settled down and allowed us to interact in person. So don't miss that out. Uh, the learn section, which provides a list of curated articles, uh, which are of uh, importance and which can help you get started or expand your learning journey together. Uh, these are annotated uh, based on the healthcare specialty a uh, direct link provided to the journal article. We can't provide many of the articles themselves, uh, but the links are available there. Uh, and of course, there is a filter option so you could filter for your favorite specialty. Uh, there are many journals that are focused on AI in healthcare. And if you want to filter the learn section for journals and want to know which journals you should follow, you could do that by, uh, as I said, filtering for journals and they will be available to you. And there are a lot of books being written. Uh, Dr. Hoyt is here. Uh, he uh, has uh, written a few books uh, and he has also contributed to many book chapters. So if you want to know which books you should be reading and getting uh, up to speed with, uh, again, go to the learn section, filter it by book and you can find uh, excellent reading material over there. Uh, data is something that everybody is looking for, and we have one of the largest uh, repositories of links to open source data sets. Of course, we can't provide data directly, so we provide you with links to these open source data sets, and we're going to talk more about it in a, in a couple of minutes. And then podcasts are important because there are many uh, experts who have already worked in this field, uh, whether they are data scientists or whether they are clinicians who are applying AI to healthcare, you probably want to learn about the journey. You probably want to know what their vision is for the future. And this is an exciting place where you can go and listen to their podcast. Again, it's available through all the key podcast channels. So you can subscribe it off uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, or your other favorite channels, and uh, they will be delivered directly to you. As I'd mentioned, a lot of meetings and conferences coming up, uh, opportunity to meet uh, different experts and people who are learning and learn about their work and collaborate. Uh, and also a op great opportunity to meet many of the vendors or industry partners uh, from which you can uh, learn about 
new and upcoming uh, algorithms that are being embedded in healthcare space. So you can go to our conferences section and it features a lot of uh, different opportunities. We uh, provide our year in review. Uh, we have done that for last four years. This is available on ResearchGate, it's open access. Uh, we curate uh, the publications from the prior year and I'm happy to report that uh, this 2020, 2021 year in review has been widely uh, accepted and, and received. We have had 5, 000, more than 5,000 reads in just six months uh, for this year in review. So it provides uh, great information about different specialities and what's going on with research and publication work in those areas. With that, as I said, uh, we are going to talk about data and advanced data analytics. That's the agenda for today. Going to the data part and the data section that we have uh, on BrainX community, uh, when you visit our webpage, uh, you can select the data field over there. It'll take you, take you to the data section. And we have a collection of uh, links to open source data sets. And these are annotated or these are classified, as you can see, uh, for the different specialties. Now, many are marked as general because they might be not relevant to just one specialty, but might be pertinent and relevant to many specialties. So they are marked as general. And you can search for them. You can filter them by topic, or you could search in the top search button and you will find them. Uh, it provides you direct links to the databases or data sets. Many of these data sets or databases have had key related publications. So the links to those publications are available to you directly uh, in that particular tile. And then it has a combination of both uh, data sets and databases. And the way I look at it is data sets or data sets uh, addressing a particular uh, group of variables for maybe one disease. But now there are a lot of databases which contain many data sets uh, and many different types of data sets. Uh, and that's where we have these available to you. So if you look on this slide, uh, look in the middle uh, tile, uh, there is a Nightingale Open Science data set. Uh, and that has a whole host of data sets that are available, uh, ranging all the way from pathology slides to EKGs and that are all available and ready to get your Jupyter Notebook or, or any other uh, IDE platform fired. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the filters that we currently have are based on healthcare specialties. So if you want to search for uh, a particular healthcare specialty data set, you can apply that filter and it'll showcase those data sets or databases to you. And here is an example. Uh, uh, my specialty is critical care. So I uh, look for critical care databases and data sets, and these three and more came up. So you could apply the filter and find your specialty based data set. Uh, we are also working on uh, adding additional filters so that you could search based on type of data. So whether it's imaging data or text data, we are working on, on making that available to you soon too. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, there are data sets and then there are databases. An example of uh, databases is like the hugging face uh, data sets. When you go in there, you'll find a lot of different uh, data sets that are, that are currently available. So more than uh, 2,600 data sets uh, that are available over there and at least 13 data sets with medical term search come up uh, when I did that recently. So you could leverage those different data sets to get your research or uh, publication work going. And then there are a few other data resources that we make available through the data section, uh, whether it is about uh, learning uh, how to use uh, data. Uh, there is Kaggle, there is GitHub. Uh, there are various other resources uh, about strategic plan from uh, NIH uh, on how they want to advance data analytics. So a lot of these resources are available to you, again, through the data section and uh, you could use them. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop my screen share and invite uh, Dr. Hoyt uh, to uh, give his presentation. And 
There you go, Bob. You should be able to get your your screen shared. Okay. Are you seeing the uh, PowerPoint first page? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are able to. We are able to see that. Uh, and for introduction, Dr. Hoyt uh, is an exceptional uh, leader in this space. He has taught many of the health informatics and data science uh, programs over the last many years. He has authored three textbooks, I read, as I had mentioned previously, and some of them are listed uh, on in our books section. Uh, he teaches a data science workshop in US and Australia, rather I would say now across the world uh, with the ability to do it virtually. He's on the board of Medical Intelligence Society and ABAM that I have the pleasure of serving alongside him. I've learned a lot from him. Uh, he's a great resource. He conducts many of the workshops. Probably he can talk more about it. But uh, Dr. White, thank you. W welcome. And we look forward to learning from you today. Thanks, Payush. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, before I get started, I want to kind of comment on the obvious. That is, be aware that the people around Tampa Bay and Sarasota are having a really hard time today and tomorrow. Uh, I'm fortunate I'm in Florida, but I'm in the panhandle where we're just getting wind, but uh, they're facing an almost category five hurricane. So, you know, I, I just, my heart goes out to them. Uh, what I wanna talk about is data science tools for clinicians. And, and what I mean by that is uh, talk about tools that are free, that are available, that are intuitive, that help close the gap between clinicians and data scientists. Uh, this is just a simple uh, you know, chart or image of showing the gulf between data scientists, clinicians, and clinical informaticians and health informaticians that we know the clinicians are, are strongest in their domain. They know how hospitals and clinics work. They know what patient needs are uh, probably better than most. And clinical informaticians certainly know more about uh, workflow and privacy and security. And a lot of what they do centers around the electronic health record. Data scientists, on the other hand, are experts in programming, usually R, Python, SQL. Also, they, they are able to access databases, data warehouses, data lakes. They're very good at statistics and very good at higher math, specifically linear algebra and calculus, but they often have no idea whatsoever about the healthcare domain. So that is a gap that has to be narrowed, I think, that, and we all benefit. You know, Payush and I often have commented that data science is a team sport. You really have to have expertise in all areas. So clinicians can certainly assist data scientists and vice versa. Now, there's another chasm or gap I want to point out, and that is if everybody on this call agreed, oh, yeah, we need to teach more data science, well, my question would be, who's going to do that? Who's trained to do it? What program's going to promote it? What textbooks are you going to use? Are the students anxious to learn more? Uh, there are these kind of gaps. I have a textbook in, on health informatics and I can tell you, every time we launch a new edition, it takes two or three editions to get people, all of them up to speed. Even though we give them PowerPoints, we give them an instructor manual, we pretty well teach the course for them. It takes that long for the transition. So need to be mindful. And also, what are the incentives? Uh, are there incentives to teach more data science right now? Maybe. I, I can't honestly answer that across the board. And another thing that I'm very acutely aware of, because I was in private practice in a small area for 15 years, and it was an eye opener of the fact that I did not have nearly the tools of the Mayo Clinic, Stanford, Cleveland Clinic, I'll mention. So be mindful that if you're a small facility organization, you're probably doing descriptive statistics and spreadsheets, possibly your access in a relational database, but it's only till you get to really cutting edge healthcare systems, do you have data science teams? Are you capable of AI really? Can you access big data really? And so you have a variety of specialists and this keeps changing by the way, 
uh, that I'll comment later. This is actually an old slide. There are more ways uh, that people can get educated in this space than just what I listed. Now, this is my kind of view of the playing field for data science. You begin with exploratory data analysis with descriptive statistics and data visualization uh, and plus data cleaning. And I'm gonna say that's basically the same thing as data literacy. It's getting comfortable with data, understanding your way around, knowing where to find data uh, and getting to first or second base with it. Then you may step up your game and learn machine learning, which is really basically these days, predictive analytics and modeling. And that would be largely supervised learning and unsupervised learning less so, uh, but this is where you would progress to. And then lastly, you'd progress to deep learning, which is really all about uh, complex neural networks so that you can do image recognition and natural language processing, uh, which again is really complex. It requires a much higher level of programming and it certainly requires linear algebra. Computers will not read images or paragraphs. They'll only read ones and zeros. And then why should you care? You know, wh why, why is data science important? Well, number one, you've seen the quote, data is the new oil. And one of my students or participants in the workshop said, yeah, but in healthcare, it's crude oil. Uh, I love that. That's going in a new book that I'm writing because Healthcare has messy data. It has a lot of challenges that economics principally does not. So I think number one, you want to be prepared for clearly uh, what you're seeing is the implementation of machine learning AI in almost every specialty. So you want to be bilingual to the best of your ability and a better understanding of the medical literature. I, in the last five or six years, I pretty well pivoted totally from health informatics to data science. I think, you know, I had to think about that today. What in the world prompted that? I think because I'm a reviewer for many medical journals, all of a sudden I was seeing, no longer seeing logistic regression. I'm seeing XG boost. I'm seeing random forest. Uh, I had to suddenly go back to school and learn a tremendous amount. I have listed there in the lower left an actual example from like two weeks ago from an article out of Jamia. I won't mention who the authors were, but let's put it this way. Tucked in the supplemental file elsewhere was the actual confusion matrix. And what they were trying to do is predict non-ST elevation MIs in the ER based on lead to EKG. Sounded good. It was interesting. And their ground truth was based on did they you know, have a jump up in their troponin level. Well, what was interesting was, so they adjusted the receiver operator curve threshold so they could get a sensitivity of 0.85. What they didn't comment on is look down where it says best model, actual negative, predict, but predicted positive. What that means is they, you have 667 false positives. 130 true positives. So the ratio of false positives to true positives is five to one. As clinicians, do you want to see, say, four or five alerts to every real one? Probably not. So it's just, what's my point? My point is, I do think that this is becoming almost part of data literacy. Uh, certainly, if you want to review a medical journal, the first thing you ought to be looking for is the confusion matrix. So you can calculate those things the authors didn't include, which unfortunately is common. They cherry pick, I'm sorry to say. So when we talk about obstacles to data science, there are many. I mean, in my case, we didn't study any of this in medical school. And, and I have to say my alma mater is not doing a whole lot better uh, today. Some are. Uh, I did undergraduate University of Virginia. They now have a uh, whole college of data science. They have a combined program in uh, data science and an MD degree. So it varies across the board, but the perception is you have to program, you have to understand linear algebra and calculus, and you have to be a wizard at statistics. Uh, that's only partially true. And we'll talk about other pathways. So the, the formal pathway would be to get 
probably a master's degree in data science or biomedical data science or biomedical informatics, which is becoming just like data science. And you now have, I think, roughly 30 master level programs in artificial intelligence. Problem there is you better be a data scientist to enroll. They expect you to be very experienced in programming, math, and statistics before you ever sign up. Self-study is fine, but how many people complete those courses? Uh, certainly the very motivated do, but it's difficult uh, to take courses if you're a practitioner and you get home late at night and so forth. And then you've got option, are there any hands-on tools that are intuitive, affordable, make sense? And that's sort of what we're gonna talk about. We talk about what's available. I'm only gonna talk about three uh, programs. There are more, but that's all that time would permit. First one is a series of stats packages. Uh, I'm choosing these because they're free, open source, all based on R, and all very good with excellent user manuals. Visualization, you have a lot of choices. You're probably already using Excel or Ju uh, Google Sheets. Tableau is probably the most popular in most industries, I might add, but Power BI for business is certainly popular. And then we get down to machine learning. And this is an area, I'll present a slide that I have tested all of these over an extended period of time. And I have kind of a chart where I compare them and I'll show that in a minute. All right, let's go to the open source R-based stats package comparison here. What that means is that you don't see the programming language R, but when you perform a statistical function like you create a box plot or you ask for the mean and median, R is in the background doing all of this. And when I drew these arrows, what it means is that Jamovia is, is an excellent starting place. It's pretty simple. It does, it does the basics. It certainly will do linear regression and logistic regression, excellent visualization, excellent descriptive statistics. That's about it. JASP is out of the University of Amsterdam, superb program. It includes more yet. It includes more supervised learning, more unsupervised learning. None of them include computer vision or image analysis or text mining. Blue Sky Statistics has been adopted by uh, Mayo Clinic, I think their research division, because it saves them a tremendous amount of money compared to SAS or SPSS. And so this is just my rating system. This is one person rating them. So when you look at, and, and again, hopefully we'll do a quick hands-on here, uh, is just this is what you see. It's very intuitive at the top. You see a spreadsheet type uh, appearance here, uh, and you can go to descriptives, and we'll do that in a minute. Uh, this is also just an example of some distribution of cholesterol uh, with and without heart disease, absent presence of heart disease. Uh, and also if you use the down carrot, you can copy it. And this is APA quality. So if you were fortunate enough to, to publish in Annals of Internal Medicine or New England Journal, it would have to be APA quality. And the tables and charts and these R-based programs are of APA quality. But we'll show you how simple it is. But look at the far right that I put in here, regression, classification, clustering. That's a pretty good menu. That's going to do 90% of machine learning and basic uh, exploratory data analysis. Uh, it's really very good. And the support, I, I, I had a question about logistic regression. Within an hour or two, I don't know if it's a graduate student, I don't know who it was, but they responded and solve the problem. Let me see, I see something in uh, chat here. Uh, okay. So this is just classification with random forest. What I like about it is they give you a whole lot of scores, including something you've probably never heard of, Matthew's correlation coefficient, which really rates both the, the positive class and the negative class. So this is great. My misgiving about it is number one, it only does one algorithm at a time. And also it, it isn't easy to see whether they're, they're talking about training data or test data. And, and so that would be to me a shortcoming, nothing wrong with their rock curves, they're fine. Um, 
Let me see. So let's move on then to when, when I mentioned that I've looked at a lot of other programs, I, I really looked at these for months and months and months to see how intuitive they were, how comprehensive they were, and would they be good for a class if you taught a class. And so here are the rankings and ratings. Uh, all of them have good points and bad points, so to speak. But clearly, I thought, in my opinion, that Orange, which I'll discuss next, was the clear-cut winner. Now, Orange is not based on R, it's based on Python. And this is an example of visual programming. Uh, K-N-I-M-E and Rapid Miner, also visual program where you drag something onto a screen, connect it, and Python uh, does the, the rest for you. You don't have to do any calculations. So it was created purely for education out of Slovenia, the University of Ljubljana. Uh, and they've done an excellent job and they continue to enhance it along the way. It has been cited in the literature, not a great deal, but some, including in journals as uh, prestigious as Nature. Uh, it does come with lots of YouTube videos, has lots of help menus. It's said to be used at two or 300 universities in the world. I can't confirm that's true. It is, it, I can confirm it's used as the Baylor, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, it, it does do all the descriptive stats and visualization, supervised and unsupervised learning, image and text mining. It has all kinds of educational tools. If you toggle or mouse rather over the or rock curve, it'll tell you what the threshold is. You also have educational tools where you can change the threshold and then look down in the lower left and see, in other words, you change the threshold from 0.5, which is the default to say 0 0.6, 0 0.8, whatever, and you can actually see what happens to sensitivity and specificity. They have the same thing for precision and recall. So for teaching purposes, this is really very good. Uh, so what does it look like in the center? And we'll demonstrate this. I think we'll have time. Uh, you have a menu on the left. You've got your workflow here in the center. You simply go to say data, drag out a data set, connect it to all these other widgets, they call them, and then it immediately processes it. Let me just see if there's anything. Uh, yeah, and so you can get orange, it is preloaded in Anaconda, but I think it's simpler to actually download it from the orange uh, website, but you can do either. So uh, transform is a section over there that will do a pivot table. And I do want to comment that those of you who have used pivot table in Google Sheets or Excel, uh, it, it may take you 10, 15 minutes to remember how to do it. It's much quicker, much easier in orange. Same would be true of merge. I can join tables with the SQL command, but merge is much simpler. You take a, some several CSV files have some unifying uh, number like the patient sequence number and you can append the data. So you can do a whole lot transforming, cleaning up and analyzing the data here. Uh, and, and so in fact, let's see, of course, imputation is not listed here, but it is one of them as well for missing data. So, and so let me go over a couple of things. Algorithms, I think they're like 11 families. I'm not a, familiar with any program that lists this number, but the neat thing about it is, you know, I, I showed three algorithms over here, neural networks, random forests, and logistic regression. It could have been all 12 or, or 11. And you go into test and score, open it up, which we'll do, and you see the results for all of them and you can toggle back between training and tests to see what, what, how it does on new data it's not seen before. Um, so I think that probably covers that. So it's quick. Uh, in fact, I saw a new program uh, called Auto Train uh, that Hugging Face offered. And so I jumped right on it. Couple of problems. Number one, they didn't tell you what the algorithm was. They gave you five unnamed algorithms. One took seven minutes to, to actually analyze the other one 15 minutes. Orange took under half a second for each, each algorithm. Uh, so there's no programming higher math. You can do the basic, as I already said, exploratory data analysis. And it does have lots of educational tools that are frankly unique. 
some of you might say, well, gee, it's not very complicated. It can't be any good. You can, you can tune the, the parameters or hyperparameters within each algorithm. I don't generally have students do that. The default is fine, but the point is you can do regularization of linear regression, for instance. You can do all kinds of things uh, that are available but are, are really not for beginners particularly. And there are a lot of interactive features that I hope I can demonstrate. This is an example of two things that I think are really cool. This is looking at the treadmill heart rate for people with heart disease, no heart disease. So the people with heart disease had a lower heart rate, no surprise, but this gives you the t-test to tell you that's statistically significant. Well, what if it's categorical data? Let's look at the thallium stress test was normal, reversible defect or fixed defect for the normal pe people in the, in the uh, People with heart disease are, are one, by the way, no heart disease is zero. So here's a chi-square and it gives you the p-value for that. So that's an automatic freebie. Descriptive statistics are so-so. It does give you mean, max, medium, uh, mode, uh, dispersion, and missing data, which is a good starting point, but probably not as nice as JASP, the, the distribution. But one of the things that I wanna point out that's really, again, unique, is take any one of these bars on any one of these graphs, click on it, like say this tall blue bar, this is calcified uh, coronary arteries. This is one calcified coronary artery. So most did not have heart disease, but a few did. But you could click, but for some reason, if you found it interesting that these people had heart disease, but had no calcified arteries, click on it and connect it to a data table. Now you've isolated only those people. The same is true for all the other graphs, even the decision tree, you can click on the nodes. You can click on confusion matrix, which I will, if I remember, will demonstrate. So here you get a whole uh, bevy of, uh, you know, results of performance, if you will. There's the area under the receiver operator curve and some confidence intervals. It also includes a calibration plot that I'm not aware that any program automatically includes that, and they're getting ready to publish the precision recall curve. This is unsupervised learning where I simply fed it uh, a, a data set. I didn't label them diabetic or non-diabetic, but the study was trying to uh, study African-Americans in a rural community in, in uh, uh, Virginia. And so I just fed that in, and basically it identified these three groups uh, it, that they had something in common. That used hierarchical clustering. Then I did k-means clustering and the different colors uh, measure that. I'm only mentioning that to show you an example that it does unsupervised learning. It also does educational stuff re related to graph databases. You cannot create your own database at this time in orange, but this is an example of an air traffic controller database I clicked on these, highlighted it, and then sent it to a data table, and, and it just said that's American Airlines. Uh, again, I hope that that will get better to the point where you can actually create them. And then here is image uh, classification. I wanted to see how well it did uh, when I fed it images of basal cell epithemioma uh, versus malignant melanoma. It did really well. The image viewer allows you just to take a look and see the quality of your images before you ever push the run button, so to speak. The image embedding does a complex, this is Google Inception version three, uh, I think like a hundred layer convolutional neural network and then test and score again. And I use gradient boosting uh, to see how it did. And I think the AUC was 0.9. The uh, natural language processing or text mining is good. It's not uh, totally uh, robust. It doesn't do everything under the sun. One interesting thing, though, is they give you access to, it, I call it corpora, that's I think what they use. So you can access Wikipedia, Guardian, PubMed, New York Times, and Twitter feeds. So that can be the basis of what you do. So you can, in this case, I said, well, I want to just see what the uh, Twitter feed said about vaccine sentiment. So this is the workflow. I'm not going to go over it, but you could then look at the positive versus the negative versus the neutral 
sentiments and you can mine that, so to speak. And also created a word cloud by going to PubMed. I chose monkeypox just because it's a new one. And I did pre-process to get rid of the stop words and the garbage. And, and this is just example of a work cloud. Data science workshop, as Payush mentioned, uh, my Australian one started in April. The second US one just started last month, or it's, excuse me, it's still this month. Um, and the goal here is to teach about once a month. We're in the process of, I've already written the book, it's not complete. And I, meanwhile, brought in somebody who is an expert at healthcare data analytics, who's a black belt, Lean Six Sigma, who I know will make the book even better. Uh, on the right here are the current chapters, but I think that could change. But that gives you the gist of it. Uh, it's intended to be a very user-friendly book. We have put in a ton of QR codes that link to videos, to StatQuest, uh, to Orange, and to other places. You know, the neat thing about a QR code is whether it's a print book or an e-book, uh, the, the QR code still works. So, and we'll have a YouTube channel. We'll have some other stuff. So the, the other program, the third program, which is unique, and I suspect none of you have heard about, is a new online database platform called Bit.io. I spent a whole lot of time looking at other databases in order to teach simple uh, SQL and some other things. And I stumbled on this, and it's really been uh, fantastic. I don't have to spin up a server as you do with MySQL. Uh, and, and, and SQL Lite's fine, but it doesn't come with any, the ability really to teach based on it. So this has a free tier, although you can only use a billion rows queried per month. I know a lot of you all are much heavier than that, tongue in cheek. Uh, it's browser-based, it's PostgreSQL, which is very similar to SQL. Uh, everything you need is on one page and hopefully I can show you that. Uh, it, it has all kinds of bells and whistles. You can connect it to Orange, although it's a little clunky to do it. It also will collect the Python and R and lots of other programs. And they have a very active, when it says chat here, what I mean is uh, that's like a support chat if you have a question. So conclusion, I think basic data literacy is important for healthcare workers, particularly clinicians. We also need a medical work force knowledgeable in ML and AI uh, because the articles are not always up to snuff. They, they need people to critically appraise the article. When, uh, the data scientists need your input about what's important, what's not. And ultimately, when you talk about sensitivity and specificity, that's a clinical decision. I've already mentioned, and you know what will happen if you have too many false positives, people will start throwing things because you'll have alert fatigue. And I state, while formal training to become a data scientist is really out of reach for most practicing clinicians, there are courses and tools that help narrow the gap between data science and medicine. And that please, if you have questions regarding this, please just email me at rehoyt at gmail.com because uh, I, I went over the high points, obviously. Now, let me see if we will be so lucky that we can uh, actually do a live demonstration. Let's start. I think we're doing okay for time, right, Payush? We're okay? Yeah, we are good. Okay. All right. So when this is uh, orange already opened up, you can shrink the menu over there if you want to, so you have more room. Uh, if you want more programs, I, I didn't mention you go to add-ons because basically I downloaded the modules I thought were interesting, but in point of fact, it, it, these are all Python packages, basically. Uh, you can do uh, spectroscopy. The guys that developed this were computational biologists, so they're really into amoeba and cellular biology and all that. So there are other programs that I certainly don't use. But the point is, what I want to just kind of demonstrate is the simplicity. Let me go back to showing the, that. So if you, you want to upload data, you could just pull out file, open up file. 
this already is preset on heart disease. It has like six programs in here. But a couple of cool things is you can, first of all, download data by just putting in the URL. If you have a CSV file on a Kaggle page or whatever page, you put the URL in or Google Sheets, by the way. Another reason to use Google Sheets, you put in that URL and suddenly it goes directly over here. You don't have to download it and then upload it. Um, the other thing that I notice on the left here, it says how many instances are rows, how many features are columns, how many are missing. It says cla classification, categorical class with two values, no missing values. And so you can go down and actually, let me change this. Uh, let's make that a feature. But what we want to do is here we're going to use, we would use presence or absence of heart disease as our target, hit apply, but you can change all these. You can go in and change uh, what is a target, what isn't. Target meaning the uh, outcome or class. You have one other option. If you drag and drop data sets, there are 65 data sets there for you to play with. It tells you whether the target's categorical for classification or numerical for regression. It tells you the field. And usually like if you open one up, like car evaluation, it'll tell you where it came from and what it's all about. So it gives you a lot of data sets to play with. Now here, we're not dividing uh, our data into test and uh, train, but actually let's do that show you how easy it is. Let's put insert and let's put data sampler. Open it up. It's set to divide it into 70% training, 30% uh, testing. And then we need to connect to. And so you go in and let's be sure we like that. Nope. What we want is data sample the data and remaining data is test data. Now we're okay. All right, so down here on the left, I don't think, I, again, box plot is one of my favorites, uh, simply because there's so much you can do. It gives you the inner uh, corner, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, the IQR here, the range of it, which functions like a confidence interval. So you can, this is by, if you look up here, it's cholesterol by gender. And you can change this uh, around to whatever you want, but it's a great place to start analyzing your data, uh, looking at different things like ST depression, let's say by heart disease. Well, no surprise, far more uh, ST depression if you have heart disease uh, uh, as one, by the way, it means heart disease zero means you don't. And, and you look at the p-value. So the point is, it's a great place to start uh, analyze your data. Ta data table is great because it tells you uh, exactly what you're looking at, and you can you can do ascending or uh, descending uh, sorting. But anytime you do something and you say, "Well, I'm not sure what I just did," you can attach a data table to it, and that's what this is doing. Let's just look at confusion matrix. And I'm concerned about these false negatives, uh, meaning they had an abnormal cardiac catheterization, but were predicted to be normal. Well, I highlighted that, and now I have just those patients. That's all that's in there. So that's, I think that's enough of orange. Let me go quickly. Let's see, let me get this out of this menu out of the way. So when you go to BitIO, this is really what you see. Doesn't look like any database I've ever seen. You can immediately start uploading files. Let's sign in. And we're not gonna create a new database. We're gonna look at the one we already have. And this is an NHANES database. You're welcome to have 5,000 patients with uh, about 48 predictors that run the gamut from most anything you can think of. I just added TSH, vitamin D, vitamin B12, and a COG screen. It also has grip strength, pulmonary function. It's got a ton of stuff, but the point is it really makes it easy. So 
doing a simple SQL command, what this SQL command says, select the sequence number, which is a patient identification. I wanna see the A1C levels, the database, so from the database, adult NHANE CSV, but where the AUC is greater than eight and the page in the age is greater than 60. So I wanna see older people out of control besides me. Uh, so there's the sequence number to tell you the patient is. There is the 8.5 and we could have, let's just put comma age run query and there's age. So there you've got the query, the A1C and the age. I'm, I'm not gonna do, let me see how we're doing for time. I'm not gonna do more queries, but, but let me point out a couple of things that this is a great program if you wanna learn simple SQL and the best tutorial that I've seen that's free and totally logical is called SQL Bolt, B-O-L-T. So the combination of this program and that is very powerful. And there's your share button that you can bring in collaborators, connect if you wanna to connect to a remote program. I won't go over that, but the connect button does that. Very, very intuitive. Lastly, I'll just bring up JASP real quickly. So in here, we'll just go open recent file. We'll do the heart disease again. You go to descriptives and let's say we just want to look at, let's see, what can we pick on here? Uh, let's pick on cholesterol. We'll start with that. So there's cholesterol, just giving you the main stuff. But what about cholesterol by heart disease? Well, let's split it by heart disease. So there is the result of the presence of heart disease. Cholesterol is a little higher. You can combine, we can throw age in there. You can see how easy that is. So that's your descriptive. And the statistics, you go down further. Uh, you can, again, here's your quartiles. You can add that. So now again, it functions like confidence intervals. Um, you can do variance. There's your IQR. And there's your basic plots. It too will do a nice, uh, several plots. I mean, the customizable plots I prefer in the sense, uh, I like box plots and scatter plots are helpful. Uh, and I'm not gonna go over all of those, except to say again, if you wanna do machine learning, it's very easy. You, you do boosting target is your heart disease presence or absence of those, whoops, those people that had, uh, let's see, no. Let me think about that. Why is that? Oh, it's boosting regression, that's why. That's not what I want. I want boosting classification, no wonder. Okay, so you put heart disease in there which is categorical. And you can just start, you could uh, do a bunch of them like this, drag them over there and it'll start doing, it, it's that easy and that quick to go ahead and do the data analysis. Uh, and what you'll see here in a minute. So it's very easy to do, uh, I think it's still thinking in terms of the actual result. Again, certainly not as fast as orange. But I wanna sort of stop it at that point. These are all programs that you can download yourself and play with, very easy. Uh, anybody could do it. I, and again, good books go with those. Um, but let me, just stop it right there and open it up to any questions that you might have. Well, uh, thank you, Bob. This uh, was a awesome overview of all the tools that are available in such short period of time. Uh, and I'm sure everybody uh, over here and many who would watch this later on would benefit from, from learning about them. I, it, I agree, it's very hard to showcase all these tools in such short period of time with the details uh, of these. But uh, we showcased 
uh, different data sets that are available. So you already have data sets that are ready to, to get fired up. And you have all these tools to get started that make it easy. And then you showcase many of the courses or many of the learning opportunities uh, that are available. And we also showcase those through, through BrainX community. So I hope that gets many people started uh, in their journey. Uh, it's, we are a small group. So if anybody has a question, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, you could ask your question. Bob, the only thing I would, uh, uh, I would respectfully have a slight difference of opinion. Uh, I did a lot of courses uh, online and uh, I do think there is value in a lot of those courses. Interestingly, a lot of those courses through Coursera or Udemy or through some of these other uh, MOOC uh, platforms, uh, they are, they have been developed by a lot of universities and a lot of experts from, from these places. Uh, I do differentiate them uh, in the sense that there are courses where you just watch certain videos. There, there is no interaction, there's no feedback and, there, and, and you just complete it and that's all you do. Then there are some courses where you have to do some coursework, but then at the same time, you also have to do a project work. You have to submit that project work. You get feedback, it gets graded. And what I've learned is uh, when I try to do just the ones that, or a bunch of videos put together, it, it doesn't really work well for, for me because there's no feedback there. So if you have to select, I would always recommend selecting those where uh, just like Bob, your courses are fantastic. Your workshops are fantastic where there, there is more interaction. There is learning from the feedback and you can do some hands-on on project work. So of course, I always uh, recommend all the workshops and the courses that you do looking forward to the, to the new book too. Uh, but some of those courses are valuable. Uh, the other thing I realized is we are all short of time. So I'm trying to multitask and while doing my stationary bicycle, I could watch certain videos and, uh, and get that work done. <laughs> uh, so I think that there is some benefit to, to those courses, but you do need to be careful about which ones you select. Yeah, and I think that would be something that would be worth sharing in the BrainX community is which ones did you know, practitioners find yeah. useful and, and was not a waste of their time. Uh, you, you know, no, there are definitely some good courses that, that I've taken as well, uh, but you have to be very motivated. And, and yes. I, I make one other comment about programming is if you have a background in programming, I, I think it's fine. And now there's a lot of auto ML packages that I could present that save you a tremendous amount of time. But I, I, I want to emphasize it takes you to about somewhere between third, second and third base. You're a shortstop, in other words. It doesn't take you all the way around the third base or home uh, if you want to do, say, uh, computer vision. The, the number of lines of code to create a convolutional neural network is really alarming. And you really would need somebody. You need a mentor helping you because believe me you would lose your way so but i think it's just a matter of time where that changes and where you just tell ai create a convolutional ne network with 50 layers blah 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 and it's going to create it so i mean already you have you've seen microsoft's copilot program uh which will write code it, however, right now, it's only useful for expert programmers. In other words, if the expert tells it to do something, it just saves time. They don't have to create repetitive loops. It'll do that for them. But I think it's just a matter of time before uh, you'll be talking into the computer and it'll be coding. So, you know, that a lot of that's going to change. I mean, I, I have a, a talk that I'm going to give, by the way, coming up. Payusha put in there Hoyt's law, what seems impossible and uh, unlikely today is tomorrow's standard. You know, I mean, this field is really breathtaking in terms of how fast. Another example is these large language models. You know, th there, there's a ton of them out there. They train on billions of uh, data points and whatnot and have trillions of parameters. I said, yeah, great. But how are you going to use that in medicine? Well, a week ago, NVIDIA released a, what amounts to be a biological 
uh, large language model, which is going to analyze everything we know about DNA, RNA, proteins, genomes, phenotypes. And so you're going to say to it, okay, I, I want to know what is the cause of ALS? You know, what? I, I'm being facetious, but the point is that, so that may be how we end up using uh, large language models in medicine. So we don't know what we don't know. And, and, and so that's another corollary in this field. Uh, so anyway, this is exciting. I'm a, totally the wrong age to be doing this, but uh, it is exciting. And I, I wish everybody luck moving forward. Yeah, no, I, uh, that's, that's great, Bob. And continuing on the large language model, because that, that's what I spend a lot of time working on, uh, the NLP and the NLU part. Uh, I would highly recommend visiting Hugging Face. Uh, they have a lot of large language models. Uh, there are some data sets, as I had mentioned previously, and some of the models that you can just download, they're already built, pre-built over there, for uh, which are based on PubMed or uh, Mimic data set. So you, so you could, they're pre-trained using those. So you could just download them. And actually on the website, you can go and try them out too. And it, it gives you, it's very responsive. So highly recommend using Hugging Face uh, for, for language models for sure. But uh, let me ask you another question. I think we talk about the simplicity of, of expression of machine learning or advanced data analytics. This is how I look at it. This is all about how you're expressing it. But behind everything, behind, behind all this, uh, there, there are these equations. And many times I describe it uh, in, from the context of writing a poem and the context of the poem and how you write it. So yes, you might write it very beautifully, but there's a context, you know, the, the poet had to think about that context and, and everything and then express it. So this is the expression part and how, how you can make it easier. How important is it for somebody to understand those equations and the application of those equations? Yes, we might have 12 options to pick from uh, in that menu list that I could use random forest or I could use support vector machines or I could use something else. How important is it to understand the math or, or those equations uh, to be able to use these in your opinion? Well, I'm gonna say a couple of things, one of which is not popular, but I think it's true, is that if it, that is, you wanna do machine learning, you have a medium sized data set, say 500,000 patients, it's it, the functions are linear, meaning you're looking at relationships between X and Y. Okay. So it's kind of like the database data sets I just showed you on heart disease. There's absolutely no evidence that any of the new algorithms are any better than logistic regression. I mean, lo logistic regression has been the mainstay for years and years and years. And it's true that for instance, XGBoost may have a few um, advantages over maybe missing data and a few other things, but the push comes to shove, it really doesn't outperform logistic regression. And there's a classic article uh, that I could cite, you may wanna see that, that goes over that. The other thing is that in point of fact, what I do uh, is when I have a new data set, I run a ton of algorithms from each family. In other words, a tree, an ensemble tree. You can do stacking we didn't even talk about. You can combine three or four algorithms in orange, which will make their performance better. But still, the, and, and I have to throw in there one more, naive Bayes. Bayes goes back to 1763, older than me. And it's still useful for a ton of things and so many times when I look at a typical data set that I'm looking at, logistic regression and naive Bayes outperforms random forest, XGBoost, SPM, and some of the newer ones. But like I just said, nevertheless, I run one from each family just to see. But again, there are unique circumstances where it is conceivable one of the newer ones might outperform uh, 
say, logistic regression, but by and large, it does not. And also for years and years, we looked at odds ratios, which are generated from logistic regression. So it's very transparent. It's not a black box. I mean, you can get some results that I, I don't know whether you all have talked about SHAP and Lime and all that. So there are ways that you can unlock the black box uh, technique, but none are as transparent and obvious as, as uh, logistic regression. Great thoughts, Bob. Uh, any last minute questions for, for Bob or uh, myself? I, I have a question. I put, Pyush, how are you? Steve, yeah. thanks for joining us. The great, great presentation, uh, Dr. Hoyt, and I, I. It's clear to me that you know that that you know a lot about this topic and the representation of various tools to work. I, I, I think is is critically important to launching a data science practice uh, for certainly for a medical institution if you're going to try to get con clinicians involved, right? Simplifying to that to that point. What what I know about, I'm gonna find a way to make this about cybersecurity, Pius. <laughs> so, uh, what what I know about enterprises is that they have an approved set of tools to use, right? And so we come up with all these tools for learning data science, and I I I think your evaluation of various different tools to use, um, because of simplicity or you know, whatever the case may be, uh, is is very valuable, right? But to to get an application from experimentation to production in an enterprise is, is going to require being on an approved set of tools or you know being consistent with the security protocol. So my my question is like how secure are, are these applications and is is that something that you consider as you know when you evaluate them? Well, I mean, first of all, Orange and uh, Jasp are client, you know. In other words, they're on your desktop, uh, so I don't particularly worry about those. I mean, it's true they could have a virus. There's a lot of other things that could happen. Uh, I can't comment about BitIO being new and being browser-based. Are there any threats? You probably know more about that than I do. Uh, I, I assume in face value that that's part of their infrastructure is, is you know, security. So, I mean, how safe is the average new app, web app that comes out there? But Steve, that, that's a very important point. Before you put your data uh, on to some of these applications, you need, need to be cautious about that because that, that data might have some critical information that, that you want to make sure is not made accessible to, to rogue agencies in many ways. So thank you for, for bringing up that very important point. But also I think uh, the, a lot of these tools are there to get you started to get you insight into various different things. When you talk about like machine learning as a continuum or machine learning as operations like MLOps, uh, I think that's a completely different ball game and a completely different field. And it's evolving very rapidly too. So mm. I'm sure a lot of simpler tools are going to come, come that way too. But, but yeah, great question, great points. Anybody else? We are already above time, but uh, happy to take one more question if, or comment if anybody has. All right, I don't see any here. So I'm just going to remind us, uh, uh, we have these sessions monthly. These are our resources. You can visit our website, brainxai.org or brainxcommunity.com. Please join us on our LinkedIn group. A uh, lot of our articles and scholarly activities shared there. Uh, subscribe our YouTube channel uh, called BrainX Community. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on your favorite channel called BrainX Talks or drop me an email. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt, for an excellent presentation. Uh, that will definitely get us started. I'm definitely, definitely learned uh, about a, quite a few new tools from you and I'm going to fire up those pretty soon. Okay, and I'm gonna be looking at BrainX data sets, so. 